change with respect to other kinds of topics that we had so far in our seminar, um, which is mainly history and philosophy of science. This is a kind of science or history of science in, a, in, an, in an enlarged way, because it will um, lead us into a different kind of world, a white and kind of world. The title of the talk is on, already on the, on the table. Thank you. So, can you hear me even you at the back, if I speak in this level? Okay. So, thank you really for coming. I mean, to those select few that came, I'm very happy with you uh, being here. And as Dana said, I'm a Byzantinist basically, so I'm not what you are used to seeing. Um, but this is how we look like. And uh, <laughs> that was joke number one. I promised you at least three jokes tonight. <laughs> um, so what I want to present to you tonight is a research project which is very much work in progress and has just started recently as Dana said at the Institute for Research in the Humanities. And the idea is that once it's done, it should result in my post-dissertation monograph. And so I start. Uh, in the 14th century, the visiting scholar and statesman Theodore Metocaitis and here you can see him, uh, famously wrote that there was nothing he or his contemporaries could add to what has already been said. Metohidis expressed his, this predicament in a preparatory essay to a collection of 120 uh, reflective pieces on various topics, among them Plato and Aristotle, mathematics, physics, and logic, moral questions such as the human character and conduct, the contemporary life and its advantages, Christian piety, discussions of other ancient authors such as Xenophon, Plutarch, Synesius, and politics and political institutions, Roman and Byzantine history, the nature and beauty of the creation, and many others. While there are various uncertainties with regard uh, to the original title of the collection, in its partial modern critical edition, it is published as uh, Semiosis Gomunique, or as you can see, maybe. Yes, sententious remarks in English. The introductory essay is entitled Proem, where it is also pointed out that it is no longer possible to say anything. And as Vera Vidal has shown, this aporia, uh, it opens with, belongs to a long literary tradition in ancient and medieval Greek literature, which according to him can be traced back at least to the Athenian funeral oration, so the classical time. The need to justify one's own contribution in view of the ever-growing amount of existing scholarship is no doubt familiar to most of you who write applications and such. So that was job number two. And so, um, to hit this road, for us who are experiencing life now, late in history, it is not possible to use speech in any way whatsoever, even if someone should indeed have the ability of using it. The theme of this problem is, in fact, that for those nowadays who are able to speak in any way, it is not possible nowadays to use this ability. For what is there to use it on? Practically everything has been anticipated by others, and there is not a scrap left for us now on which to use our voice. Neither that which, oh, neither that which pertains to religion, nor that which pertains to secular wisdom in other fields. And further in the same essay he wrote, there is hardly anything left for us, no room at all for any contribution of general usefulness for that person among us who is perchance able to make such a contribution, and no opportunity for an at least legitimate display of wisdom and accompanying striving for improvement. There is only the enforcing activity and confinement of the tongue at all times. For wherever someone, someone might move his mind, he cannot say anything new but only something which has already been achieved by someone else and already received by the, by the listeners. The only thing left to do is to reluctantly present the same results, either perhaps to gain glory or for some purpose, supposedly useful purpose, and now oneself self study things that others have studied before and perhaps much better, and incur ridicule, ridicule by deserting oneself on subjects where absolutely no exertion is required or of any use whatsoever. So you can see he was ancient with the fact that what's the point of me saying whatever since everybody said it much better than me before. Metaphysics' preoccupation with the impossibility 
of saying, or more precise in this context, of writing anything new, even if one possesses the skills necessary, can be puzzling in a number of ways. One possibility arises from a view on Byzantine thought and literature, which has only recently been a subject to revision. Namely, that for a while, Byzantine culture was perceived as extremely conservative, bound by its Greco-Roman and Christian heritage, and thus it was deemed negative and even hostile to innovation, or to use the Byzantine term to skenotomia. Similarly, when it comes to Byzantine philosophy, Karl Grumbacher famously categorized Byzantine philosophical works as part of Byzantine literature, and speaking of the, I quote, further fruitlessness of the Greek intellect, claimed that there is no regional philosophical development in Byzantium. Just as Kronbacher's position on Byzantine philosophy has been revised by now, by scholars such as Euler, Klaus Euler, Linus Benakis, Katerina Yavudiano, to mention just a few, the scholarly, scholarly perspective on Byzantine studies towards innovation and originality has shifted as well as the 1995 publication of a collection of essays entitled Originality in Byzantine Literature, Art and Music suggests. Notably, Alexander Kuzdan characterized the state of affairs as, I quote, the fallacy of Byzantine traditionalism and, I quote, the stigma of absolute mimesis, and concluded that, I quote, we shall never progress if we formulate the problem in a rigid way, imitation or innovation. There was both innovation and imitation in Byzantium, and surprisingly or not, the more the Byzantines imitated or studied antiquity, the more innovative they became. And Most recently, in two short pieces discussing innovation in Byzantium, published respectively in 2010 and 2014, Apostolos Panos argued that Byzantine lexicographical sources define kenotomia or innovation neutrally with the exception of a particular theological meaning denoting a heretical doctrine. Based on a larger selection of texts, Spanos observed further that while the verb kinotomeo would be used to denote a positively accepted innovation, the alternative neoterizo would be applied with respect to radical and unwelcome changes in particular in the political life of the entire <laughs> That was not a joke now. Now, you may be wondering how this theme of innovation connects to the topic of love for learning and erudition, which was stated in the title. And you have every right to do so, and I will try to explain it. So I ask you for a little bit more patience, patience and we'll come back. Having introduced first, uh, the first author I wanted to speak about today, Metuhitis Humuso, in his self-commissioned portrait in a church and monastery which he restored himself in the early 40s century. Now it's about time to introduce the second person I want to speak about, namely his uh, student. His student is Nikifos Grigogaz. You can see the same church. This is the, Christ, uh, the Monastery of Christ Savior at Kove in Istanbul today. And today is called Hagia Jami. And these are pictures taken by the um, Russian photographer Nikolai Avdamonov in the uh, 30s and 40s of the 20th century. Uh, you can see Grigogaz's signature in his own handwriting, and just for the sake of being fancy, uh, a 19th century engraving of, of him. So, um, in his fourth poem, Metuhitis designated Grigogaz as his intellectual heir, as well as the guardian of his library at Kova, at this place. Indeed, the wide scope of Grigogaz's numerous writings can be seen as a reflection, among other things, on the fact that he inherited the richest library in Constantinople at the time. Among lovers of history, Grigogaz is mostly known as the author of one of the three major historiographical accounts of the late Byzantine period, which he titled Roman History. So that's one thing to remember that we call them Byzantines, but they call themselves Romans until almost the very end. Byzantinists have recently become interested in his prolific geographical output and historians of religion and theologians know him as a fervent opponent of Palamite theology. On a popular level today, however, Grigogaz is rather an obscure figure, which is why you may imagine my enthusiasm when I heard Neil deGrasse Tyson mention his name in episode 3 of the 2014 follow-up of the iconic documentary series Cosmos, A Personal Voyage, 
So now the new one is called Cosmos and Space Time Odyssey. And in this episode, Grigoras was mentioned uh, as the source of the earliest precise observation of a comet Edmund Halley could find and consequently listed in his synopsis of the astronomy of comets from 1705. According to Halley, Grigoras was, I quote, a Constantinopolitan historian and astronomer uh, who did pretty accurate, accurately describe the path of a comet amongst the big stars, but was too lax as to the account of the time. So that this most doubtful and uncertain comment only deserves to be inserted in our catalog, said Halley, for the sake of its appearing near 400 years ago. So, fun facts about Grigogas aside, he was indeed among the most prominent astronomers of his time, and together with Metrohitis, <coughs> worked to reinstate in Constantinople the study of the higher mathematical sciences, and especially of Ptolemaic astronomy. What is most important to remember here is that both Metrohitis and his student Grigogas, the master and the student, were engaged in practically every branch of knowledge. Every branch of knowledge, that is, that the Byzantine curriculum in included. Thus, they portrayed a philosophical ethos, philosophical according to the Byzantine standards, characterized by love for learning and erudition, and what I'm interested in is to examine how they reflected upon it. Well, it is clear that the philosopher in this context is someone who is in some way engaged with the pursuit of wisdom, and the acquiring of knowledge, described by the Greek notions of philomathia and polymathia, which we saw at the, title, at the title slide. To me, it is not self-evident that the so-called learning, what that so-called learning in fact entails, and how far does it extend? So what are the limits of this polymathia is basically what I want to know. Following this line of reasoning, it seems to me that the concept of polymathy or erudition, uh, or alternatively, a wide-ranging wide knowledge, is problematic in itself, as the poly prefix is open to interpretation and reinterpretation. How many is enough? How many is too many? Is polymathy the end of knowledge, or is there more beyond it? And how does it relate to wisdom, which is a concept of higher order than learning? Thus, in my opinion, the investigation of the discourse of polymathy in Byzantium should go hand in hand with the study of two more concepts, namely intellectual curiosity and the already mentioned innovation. I spoke about curiosity a few months ago at the Institute, and I don't, do not want to uh, repeat myself from that previous talk, and I don't have the time to do that tonight, but still there are a few things I would like to say. So, First and most important is that polymathy still stresses the multiplicity of knowledge. So there are many things we can learn. But both curiosity and innovation refer somehow to its limits. Curiosity can be often taken in the Byzantine context in pejorative sense, just as today, uh, indicating crossing the boundaries, for instance, of uh, legitimate knowledge, that is the type of knowledge suitable to be pursued as opposed, for instance, to magic or astrology. While a claim for innovation, that is, that new knowledge can be achieved, begs the question whether that is actually possible. Remember what Metrohiti said in the beginning, that yes, it was not. And as we have seen in the beginning, yeah, this is what his preparatory essay was about. The classical tradition defined the Greek concept of curiosity, or polyparagonsini, as unhealthy curiosity, noisiness, and meddlesomeness. See, for instance, uh, on the slide, the entry from okay, the most important uh, dictionary for the classical period, Little, uh, little, um, little Scott. And as you can see here, curio curious person is defined as busy about many things, mostly in the bad sense, meddlesome, officious, a busybody, and only later a new meaning appears in the language, namely curious after knowledge. Another important encyclopedic type of source, now from the Byzantine period, is the so-called lexicon Suda, uh, which in its entry on curiosity uh, defines it in a more neutral way, and still importantly makes a distinction between curiosity and meddlesomeness, which is a distinction you can find in Plutarch as well. So what we find in this sort of encyclopedia, which was very popular in Byzantium, is that curiosity and curious 
the good or serious person is not curious. When we wish to prove this, changing curiosity into meddlesomeness, we deconstruct the proposition. For he who is curious that does not yet seem to show an obvious fault. At any rate, if a curious man is someone wrapped up in many matters, and this can also denote someone getting involved by chance. But he who is meddlesome is already displaying a familiarity with the activities and an inclination and a choice, which is antithetical to good and serious. So here, first of all, there is a moral judgment on somebody being medicine, and second of all, this moral judgment is connected to the deliberate action of choosing to be such. Unlike the Suda, Grigoras, four centuries later, justifies intellectual curiosity and inquisitiveness through their relation with the notions of philomathy or love for learning and polymathy or erudition, and claimed it to be a characteristic mark of the philosophical mind. Not all Byzantine authors, however, were thrilled with the inquisitive minds around them. Thus, in the 11th century, John Mavropoulos, Metropolitan of Ephraeta, complained in his letter 17, addressed to a certain ecclesiastic named Gregorius, about the letter's incessant queries concerning grammatical points and difficult exegesis. He wrote, it seems that he who lives next to a blacksmith must lie awake at night, as the proverb says. But for him who converses with a learned and an inquiring man, it is quite impossible to become sleepy and sluggish, for his ears are buzzed with constant problems and inquiries, as if by horse flies, and his mind is kept awake as if pricked by a sting. This I know myself from experience with your problems, for you are somewhat loquacious and excessive in your inquiries. I must speak the truth to you, the lover of truth. And you oblige me constantly to give an explanation of this, not only when you are by my side, but even from afar, you do not cease to stir up my mind, demanding answers and solutions to your problems, so that I do not, do, I do not quite find the time for rest and sleep. The attitude towards innovation outside the realm of theology could be equally ambivalent. For instance, in a letter addressed to the Constantinopolitan schoolmaster, George Carbonis, Medohitis' protégé, Grigoras, remarked on the majority's love for novelties. Grigoras, moreover, admitted that he himself, so we are back to innovation, that he himself made an attempt to satisfy the desire of his audience by discovering and presenting something new and unexpected. As I observe the majority, most excellent one, enjoying the novelties rather than preferring to make use of the already established things, it seems to me not without reason that not having invented very much, for instance, something which, in my opinion, would be perceived as a novelty, also with respect to them, that is to the majority of people, and since those who discovered something besides the expected would show themselves wise, I myself did not consider it neither something like refinement nor moreover something new, if it would be for also to me to desire to accomplish something very similar. And so I was trying to make a spring with one swallow, for I was not thinking that it becomes spring because of the presence of the bird, and rather not, but since it is spring, that the swallow behaves as in, as in spring, even if there would be one, and even if there would be more than one. In other words, being aware of an already existing trend, namely to appeal to the majority by presenting to them something new, the Bogaz did not attempt to be unique, thus bringing spring as it were, but rather to comply with the expectations of its prospective audience. In truth, the Bogaz continued, his attempt at innovation conspicuously failed, thus bringing great shame upon him, and so he vowed to never engage in such tasks again. Nevertheless, may you punish us with lots of laughter, should you should you learn about the event. For after not very long time, I discovered myself of so great and so recent hopes, after having slipped worse than it would ever occur to me. For moreover, I found a bird which has lived poorly throughout the long winter, and up to this time was not able to produce any sound, but was only whimpering something short and very weak due to the freezing to this moment of the silencing organs through which the voice is at times contained, at times projected. And in no way it would happen to me again to roll myself in such occupations. So my deed ended at certain well-known and conspicuous shame. When you hear about it, rejoice and delight in my defeat on number one. 
Thus, Gregorovas' letter 59 demonstrates that in the context of the Mises composition, innovation or kenatomia is perceived as something desirable as far as it facilitated the reception of one's literary output and increased its appeal to the majority of people. Thus, Gregorovas admitted to his correspondents to have attempted to deliver something novel, while at the same time he remarked that this pursuit in itself was nothing new and surprising. Now, more examples of positive discourse of novelty and innovation in Byzantium could be given, such as Nikiphobos Basilakis' claim in the 12th century to have created a new pseudography, this is a type of a grammatical exercise, or that of the Aristotelian commentator Sophonius in the, 13th, in the 14th century, according to which he devised a novel method of elucidating the thought of the, um, of the stabula. Metuchitis, in his essay on Synesius, while stating that innovating, and in this case he used the word xenizo, or to surprise, to astonish, in the fields of grammar and rhetoric can be condoned easily and should be done in accordance with the rules of these arts, nevertheless added that if someone is so bold as to write without hesitation in a way that is outside what most people have been taught, perhaps he is the, the more worthy of admiration. Which with Hades continues, is certainly true about Synesius. Synesius, the late antique bishop and philosopher, which you, you may know as the disciple of Hypatia, together with Plutarch, are two authorities Metuchitis frequently appeals to in his work. He even dedicated on them two of his essays in the coll collected in the sententious remark, which I mentioned in the beginning. The, the remarks present Synesius and Plutarch as examples of what the philosopher philosopher must be like, and thus it is worthwhile to examine how Metuchitis constructed their representations with regard to notions such as love for learning, polymatic curiosity, and so on. The opening line of Metuchitis' eighth essay on Synesius uh, stated that Synesius of Cyrene is a lover of every branch of wisdom, and here the Greek re reads Pandos uh, Hedastis Idu Sophias. So here, the word used for lava is Celestis from Erao and not Philos from Philem. Uh, and so Synesius is a lover of every branch of wisdom and highly successful in each of them. Synesius' love for wisdom is, however, juxtaposed with his curiosity in this context. It is also clear, writes Mephitis, that he is not impertinently and shamelessly curious. Here he uses lichnos, not polypodacmon, as we, the, which was the term I mentioned before. So he was not shamelessly curious about everything, even things that one should not be curious about, and which at the same time are impossible to investigate. Note that the Greek word translated as curious, which I just mentioned, literally means gluttonous, and is also later found in the meaning of curious or inquisitive. Further, we find Synesius as described by Metuchitis dedicated and knowledgeable again in all, in all branches of philosophy. But as I said, philosophy is the aim of his whole life, and although it's divided into very many branches, he masters them all. He is not familiar with some while being completely ignorant of others, nor is he less knowledgeable in some than, than others. No one can say of him that the man is an adherent of this or that, or a disciple of such and such a body of, of doctrine, of all the many into which the business of philosophers is divided. He is, so to speak, a common worshipper and adherent of them all, particularly the highest, those stemming from Aristotle and Plato. Similar features Metuchitis emphasized when speaking about Plutarch. Plutarch seems to have a natural talent for the whole of wisdom. He is able to write with the greatest ease about everything and is not by nature unsuited for any kind of branch of education. And further, when commenting on Plutarch's, Plutarch's treatise, treatise on Homer, Metuchitis writes that the letter demonstrates, I quote, Plutarch's abundance of wisdom, his wide learning concerning all things, his peripanta polymathias, his perspicacity and the richness of his mind, all the many beautiful treasures that he stored up, showing that the man left for nothing. This portrayal of the philosopher's persona is consistent with what one finds earlier, for instance, in the 11th century, in Michael Salot, who stated that the philosopher must be a man of all sorts, according to the poem. 
or in my political cause before the century. Such evidence has prompted Benakis and Yevodiakono to observe that, I quote, the pregnant model of the thinker in Byzantium was a sort of encyclopedic feature of philosophy, an erudite scholar who kept in touch with the sciences of the Federalium and other disciplines and set the philosophical tone of the scientific curriculum. And so it seems that a wide-ranging knowledge learning, uh, wide-ranging learning or polymathy is an essential characteristic of the philosopher according to Menuhitis and the Byzantine epistemic discourse in general. No big surprise here. Importantly, however, uh, as we have told, uh, Menuhitis did not attribute the curiosity or this gluttony for knowledge to the philosopher. And before I continue further this argument, I just want to make one small caveat about the relationship that Menuhitis established between being competent in all branches of philosophy and being talented in regard to wisdom on the one hand and being well learned. So again, on the, in the context of speaking about Synesius, he wrote that having so many talents regarding wisdom, Synesius is competent in all branches more by, by reason of his noble and forceful nature than by continuous practice and persevering and industrious work. So talent comes more than being hard work. When I try to form an opinion about Synesius, taking the facts concerning him into consideration, it seems to me, perhaps justly, perhaps not, that the man is not as well versed in the works of his predecessors. And here the word used is polymathis, so he's not polymath as far as the, his predecessors go, or that he studied them so much as some other men who are famous for their learning, and this despite the fact that he certainly enjoyed as much leisure as anyone and lived a life of detachment from worldly affairs, fitting for a philosopher. Not only then, the insufficient polymathy with respect to wisdom of the previous philosophers was not, according to Matthias, an obstacle preventing, preventing someone, or in this case, Dionysius, from excelling in all philosophy, which may seem as a contradiction, at least to me. Returning to the idea of polymathy, as an essential characteristic of the philosopher in the general case, it also seems to be, the same idea also seems to be behind a polemic in Grigogas's uh, Platonizing Dialogue from 1337, Florentius or on Wisdom, which was directed against Barlanda Calabria. This dialogue addresses the question as to what being wise entails and what the limitations of human wisdom were, especially with respect to knowing the natural world. Within the dialogue, what has been read as Gregogas' philosophical and polemical stance is delivered in the voice of Nicagoras of Heracleia, who challenges the views of both certain Xenophanes and certain Xenocrates, the first representing a Greek monk from, from southern Italy, while the second stands for a certain Latin friar living in Constantinople. A scholar contemporary and belonging to the dialogue provides a key to matching these fictitious interlocutors to their historical counterparts and thus the reader is informed that Nicodobus is Gregoras uh, and Xenophanes is Varlam's allies. The debate between Nicodobus and, in, and Xenophanes uh, is provoked by the latter's boastful claim that he is knowledgeable in all sciences and is able to demonstrate it. Moreover, Xenophanes pronounces his own wisdom to be, I quote, manifold and diverse, but the Trinity Poikilium, and I quote, sufficient for all questions, as many and of whatever kinds that one may wish to ask. Through a series of inquiries, Nicodemus examines Xenophanes' knowledge and proves unsurprisingly that Xenophanes is not acquainted with any of Aristotle's teachings, notably with the latter's contribution to grammar, poetics, and rhetoric, nor his versed in the mathematical sciences despite his, claim, his claims. In this sense, having in mind the scopus of the Florentius, I have argued as elsewhere that the dialogue between Nicodemus and Xenophanes communicates what knowledge and wisdom are not, and advises against the advancement of impossible to defend claims. Important for the current argument, however, is that the procedure of proving Xenophanes is Xenophanes unwise and not knowledgeable described in the dialogue indeed included him being examined in all the sciences from grammar and rhetoric to astronomy, and being proven ignorant. 
We will thus comment on philomathy and polymathia in connection to the philosopher's persona, also more explicitly than we have seen in the dialogue, for instance, in his commentary on Synesius on dreams. You can see Synesius keeps popping up. Elucidating a passage uh, in, in uh, Synesius' work, passage 138, uh, and referring to Plato's Phaedo, Gregorius wrote that, I quote, no one who has not been a philosopher and who is not wholly pure when he departs is allowed to enter into the communion of the gods, but only the lover of knowledge. And he, Synesius, says that the philosopher is a lover of learning since he is curious and inquisitive about the nature of the beings. Gregorius referred again to the platonic association of philomathia and philosophy in his first solution, addressed to uh, an aristocratic lady, uh, Helena Pantipus Nicolaudina, daughter of uh, the emperor and wife of another emperor. The first solution, moreover, qualifies the lover of learning as an, I quote, ambitious examiner of all things, whose wisdom can expand and deepen. Plato, the son of Ariston, who was raised to the highest degree with respect to philosophy, beyond all praises, through which uh, the time graciously granted him great fame, on account of the vigor of his words, he rendered the rest in a beautiful manner as well. What is more, his strength is also accordant with those who keep away from his top. For they say that the lover of learning is exactly a philosopher. For even if it happens that the lover of learning still resides in the doorway of wisdom and has not yet set foot on the Acropolis, but as he has a clear pledge as to being a ponderer over things in the air and over those visible and audible phenomena which earth and sky produce as seasonal, and a pledge to be an ambitious examiner of all things, the probable reasoning promises presently that he shall obtain that wisdom as well. The Gugas' first solution brings me back to a question I posed in the beginning, namely, given that the philosopher is expected to be a polymath, as we saw in Metacritic's essays on Synesius and Pluto, as well as in the Gugas' dialogue, does his or her polymathy know any limits? In other words, is it possible to expand the existing knowledge, for instance, by exhibiting curiosity, and is it possible to discover new knowledge? When does learning end and wisdom begin, and what exactly is it? And here I speak about lay learning, not in the context of theology that is. In his first solution, Gregorius suggested that the lover of learning, that is the philosopher, can progress from the doorway of wisdom to its acropolis, and that being an, ambi an ambitious examiner of all things, he shall obtain wisdom eventually. Thus, intellectual progress seems to be possible, at least until reaching its end and aim, that is wisdom. Metuchitis' essay 14, entitled that the science of mathematics was not fully developed in the beginning, seems to suggest that progress or advancement can be observed in the sciences as well, a case in point being the mathematical ones. Following the development of the mathematical sciences in accordance with the tradition, from the Egyptians and the Chaldeans through the Hellenes and up to Ptolemy, Metaphysics observed. In the same way that in all other things, both those that are constantly occurring by nature and those that have been brought into man's lives by some practice or technical invention and are applied and recognized as valid in connection with anything whatsoever that is useful for the good of mankind, one can see that they do not emerge in a perfect state at the start but in each case develop initially from some slight beginning and yet are finally with time completed and established in the best way possible in and in fulfill fulfillment of their own nature. So for the mathematical part of philosophy, or rather for the whole of wisdom, but for now let us make this observation concerning mathematics, treating the subject separately. So it is possible to see that the same has happened with mathematics, namely that it did not appear at once to men or rather to the Hellenes in, in its complete form, fully developed as it was later elaborate, elaborated and reached its final form most excellently and sufficiently among those who studied it. While progress is possible in Metaphysics' view, similarly to the example from Gregorgas' first solution, as we saw before, it seems that once wisdom or the Acropolis is reached, progress is deemed unnecessary. 
in the context of the development of the mathematical sciences, the Acropolis is presented by the figure of Ptolemy. In truth, he is a man who deserves to be admired above all others for his wisdom, seeing that he, was, he has widely surpassed his predecessors and has left his successors no opportunity to add anything to the science of astronomy, or indeed to add anything to his work, but only to spend their time going over the same ground and labor with his results without contributing anything new, unless again it comes from his works. In short, Ptolemy has reached, in the most fortunate manner possible, the frontiers of his science. This brings us back to where we started, namely to Metaphysis Apovia. Since all has been said and done before, there is nothing more to add to astronomy after Ptolemy. In sum, Metuhitis told us that there is nothing he could add, oh, sorry, not yet, that there is nothing he could add in any field of thought, and then he wrote 119 essays on various subjects. <laughs> in one of them, he told us that there was nothing to be added to astronomy after Ptolemy, and then, together with the Gulags, he embarked on a large-scale project of revitalizing astronomy in Byzantium, part of which was writing his own astronomical compendium, the so-called Stichesis Astronomici, or Elements of Astronomy. To put it otherwise, while, while he kept saying that writing again on any topic is superfluous in his time, he kept doing it. Why? It has been suggested that on these occasions, Metaphysis was simply employing a rhetorical device, a captative benevolenti of sorts. It has also been suggested that the sententious remarks may not have been meant for publication. So these are his personal notes and that's it. We then has argued alternatively that it may be the peculiar style and literary form of the remarks that which provide its rationality. And or as he puts it, I quote, even if everything has been said before, there is nothing to prevent it from being expressed in novel ways. I tend to agree with the latter. It has to be noted, however, that there is one more aspect of Metaphysis' stance on the impossibility of advancing science in his own times. It is precisely that last phrase, the impossibility is conditioned on its historical setting. Ptolemy, according to Metaphysis, did indeed say something new. So, to add new knowledge is not impossible for humankind. And as we have seen, while Metaphysis worried that so late in history, he could not justify himself speaking on any subject. His disciple, Gregoras, in his letter to Carbonis, bluntly admitted of having attempted to, to do it. And now, thank you for your attention. Thank you, Nina. Questions, comments, reactions? Nina. Okay, just a quick question. Uh, what would be the role of observation? possible to uh, have new observations that can lead to new things? Yes, but they don't admit it. So um, generally, okay, generally medieval science uh, or Byzantine <coughs> mathematical science, or let's, let's speak about astronomy concretely, for instance, uh, is not an experimental one and doesn't employ, or practical one, and doesn't employ observation too much, or at least they don't record it. But in this particular period, so as, as much as we progress in the late Byzantine period, you have uh, observation becoming more frequent mentioned in the text. So he himself, the last mentions having observed uh, or determined the hour with the astrolabe, having observed this with the optics. And there are other um, mentions of observations in 14th, 15th centuries and so. So observation is performed. Uh, and certainly when it comes to phenomena like uh, eclipses, which were very frequent in the 14th century and in the 15th century, for some reason there is a really high frequency of, um, um, of, uh, of eclipses, solar and lunar, of such big magnitudes that they could be you know, successfully observed in Constantinople. So it was uh, practiced, but it's not very much reflected upon. And one reason perhaps is the fact that um, those observations suggested that a post Ptolemy tables were not any more accurate by that time. And they really knew it. I mean, they were in contact with, they had uh, Persian astronomy or Jewish or Latin being translated, which were the more dated tables. So they knew the fact that Ptolemy and Theon's tables, tables 
were not accurate anymore, but this is not something necessary as a need. But yes, observation is there, and in this case, it could bring something new. And in the, like the most famous example in this context, probably is due to the fact that Bevogas was aware that the um, precession as calculated by Ptolemy was not anymore accurate for uh, Constantinople. Uh, in the 20s, of the 14th century, he proposes actually a calendar reform because obviously it's very important to know the spring equinox so you can calculate history. So he, in his history, he relates the discourse he presented in public in the, at the court, in front of the emperor, but also in front of an assembly, uh, and relate his arguments for the inaccuracy of the Ptolemaic procession. Uh, but then his proposal for reforming the calendar was not accepted. And Varlam, against whom he argued, also writes a treatise on the date of Easter and also shows that you know, we, we can see that it's inaccurate by now, but he doesn't even argue to change the calendar. And the reason that is usually given is, on the one hand, it is difficult because they have to avoid, they have to be accurate, but also avoid pasta. So that can be a problem. But more importantly, it has to be unified throughout the entire Christian community. So if you make a change, then to reinforce it everywhere, it will be really a big disturbance in society, which is the reason that the Bogaz gives for you know, his proposal not being accepted, though the reason of it has been understood. I don't know if that's a good example that answers your question. Thank you. So, I was not entirely clear, and I'm sure you probably said it, but I didn't follow it. Is there a link or a connection in which it either necessarily follows or that it leads to from philomathia to polymathia? Or is that not a connection? Yes, it, there is a connection. The point is that since uh, polymathy is some kind of feature, whether it's essential or not, of the philosopher as presented in this higher educated discourse, uh, that's okay, that's one part. So once a philosopher, you exhibit polymathy. At the same time, because of the platonic framework that is inherited, you cannot become a philosopher if you're not already a lover of the building. So basically, they are both uh, something you portray continuously, but phenomenology has to be there from the start, whereas, uh, whereas polymathy is something that you acquire through time. And the other dialogue that we are sure that Krivogas wrote, which is called Philomathic, so the lover of learning, it actually speaks about that, that, okay, there are these two groups of students who want to learn something. And uh, one is more impatient, so they go to the office and they learn very quickly, but not really learn anything. Whereas the proper way is, well, to take your time and to learn properly. And this is what the true lover of learning does. Is it a, mm -hmm. okay? Uh, very much in the same vein of question of clarification coming from very much outside of the field, but um, isn't there a, a top of, of knowledge, has, uh, knowledge that has been lost? And if you think of a similar period in the West, that's the main topic that we know much less than the ancient and we have to recover something and there is not much to recover and you know, there is much more knowledge that has been lost than knowledge that we can save or preserve. And mm -hmm. the kind of um, image you are recreating here is an image where the stop, stop is completely missing or is there any kind of equivalent that maybe we don't know exactly all that Ptolemy had Known, maybe something has been lost, and, we can, and in this way we can recover it, and therefore we can add something. But that's new, not new in a way, but it's uh, something that we can recover that has been somehow lost in, in the translation of the manuscripts. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's a, it's a very good question. I have three points to make about it, but I'm not sure if they would be, if, you know, since I, if everybody in the world would agree with me on that, or something like that. Um, so one thing is, um, 
what, okay, there is the reality of what happens. So, of course, knowledge is being lost all the time. And in the period when they live, knowledge has been lost big time in 1204 with the Fourth Crusade, where Constantinople was burned and lots of manuscripts were disappeared, scattered, and then basically all the later generations strive to collect what is left, and that's why many types of compilation. Um, we have uh, many new types of compilations in this later period because it's basically this um, attempt to gather and to recover in practice what is happening. Another way that in practice uh, knowledge is uh, being lost is, of course, every now and then you have some time of a big encyclopedic project that makes a revision, and of course, certain things uh, you know are left out. So that's kind of what happens in practice. Um, now, one important point, which is the difference between East and West uh, in, this, in, Europe, uh, in this sense, is the fact that they didn't actually lose it. You know, the knowledge of the Greeks, they didn't lose it. So they kept the manuscripts and they kept the language. It is not the same as you have with Aristotle being, you know, translated through uh, with the uh, um, Arab movements of translation and then being recovered in the 12th and 13th century and so on. So uh, part of the identity of a Byzantine person is that he is the heir of all these traditions. Uh, so in this sense, I don't know if that is entirely true. Maybe some Byzantine somewhere commented something. I mean, you can be a frustrated heir. I think I'm the heir of Aristotle, but I know from that I wrote this dialogue and I don't have them anymore, for example. Well, I personally don't, don't yeah. have not met such because it's also important for them to claim that they have it all mm -hmm. and that nothing else is moving. Mm -hmm. um, so if we, yeah, against the, like their identity to claim that, oh, um, we are missing, you know, some Aristotle or some Plato, mm -hmm. and this is very, very important. But yeah, it, and it's a very interesting point that there is such a difference, and I never thought about it before you I mentioned. think it's extremely, I, I find it extremely interesting when you see Greek that they try to, so that means basically that they were trying to cover the fact that they don't have all Well, you can explicitly or something. Thing. I mean, that, that would be interesting if, whether you can find attempts, like explicit attempts to try to say, we have it all. And I saw them never wrote uh, exoteric dialogues like Plato. That's the subject of Inverter Echo's uh, Name of the Rose, that they're, mm -hmm. they're hiding the comedy because. Yeah. Thank you. Other questions? Thanks. Um, it, it's a very specific uh, one, but um, I was curious. Something about things that one should not be curious about, or something not to know exactly. Was it theological or also applied to what would be nature of science? Mm -hmm. Well, um, it's not clear from, from the text uh, what he means, uh, from the whole context of the whole essay, it's not clear what he means, uh, but theology is something that you certainly don't apply to your students. So, okay, that would be a history, that could be a, could be a further test. But I don't know if that's what he means as far as natural sciences go. And I, no, I don't think there is such a problem. But also, there is no such problem because the experimentation is not being part of the way they do natural sciences. For example, would be anything that you need to I'm sorry. In the field of medicine, would be anything that you need to wonder about? I actually don't know. Uh, first, because I don't know much about medicine. Second, because medicine is not part of that specific discourse. So okay. medicine is something you require a lot of education to, of course, but somehow it's always kind of an advantage to the main curriculum. Mm -hmm. So it's something you kind of learn from your master, and there are monasteries so, or, and which maintain hospitals, and there are doctors, of course. And uh, you have the late antique medical treatises that keep being used. And, but it's something that really doesn't much appear in this very high sort of mm -hmm. education, this course of 
and the erudites in Constantinople in the 70s. I, I really don't know. Any other questions? Okay, if there are no other questions, I think enough. Thank you very much for your patience. And I hope, you know, many you won't remember any of these names. I, there's no need to remember them. But, you know, if you remember that he was mentioned in Cosmos, then that's kind of a good point. Or that he was mentioned by Alice. Yes. <laughs> also, that's relevant. Thank you.